Welcome to the second day of the National Voluntary Blood Services Program webinar series as a culmination of the National Blood Donors Month being celebrated every July with the theme, Dugoyanihan Isang Familia, Isang Bansa, Isang Lahi. This afternoon, we are very fortunate to have three lectures to be given by well-known speakers in their fields of expertise who are going around the Philippines and also internationally to share their knowledge and skills. For the topic, current good manufacturing practices, quality management in the clinical laboratory, we have Mr. Felicissimo D. Martinez Jr., RMT, DB, ASCT, SDB, who we finally call him as Sir Ricky Martinez. He is a multi-awarded medical technologist by PAMET USA and PAMET Philippines. He finished his bachelor's degree in medical technology at the Royal Pontifical Catholic University of the Philippines, the University of Santo Tomas. He has 37 years of practice in the blood bank industry with over 25 years of supervisory and managerial experience in the transfusion service, blood component manufacturing, reference laboratory, quality assurance, and record review department. He was a member of the American Society of Clinical Pathologists, specialist in blood banking in the USA. He has a diploma in management and human relations from the Dale Carnegie USA and also a green belter of the Six Sigma and Kaizen Lean process. Our second speaker, who will give us a review and update on TTI confirmatory protocol, is Mr. Kenneth Aristotle T. Punzalan RMT, also a proud Somatian, who finished his bachelor's degree in medical technology at the University of Santo Tomas. He is currently a medical technologist free at the RITM and designated at the RITM Transfusion Transmissible Infection National Reference Laboratory as Equus Officer, Data Manager, Communication and Engagement Officer. He has been a speaker, trainer, and facilitator in Equus External Quality Assurance Team. HIV and other PPI proficiency testing training workshops and biosafety and risk assessment training for blood service facilities. He has been an author, investigator, and co-author of various published researches on PPI equal. They are our two speakers this afternoon. As a reminder to our participants of this webinar, please mute your microphones so that we will not distract our speakers while they are lecturing. You may click the three dots, more options at the bottom of your screen, and please use the Q&A button to post your questions to be answered by our speakers after the third lecture. Now please sit back and relax, and let us now listen to the first speaker on the topic, Current Good Manufacturing Practices. Sir Ricky, please take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Does everybody hear me now? Thank you, Dr. Kalim. Thank you for that nice introduction. Okay, I'll try to share the content of my presentation. Sandale. Hindi ko alam ito ah. Joanne, you're still there. Uh, okay. Joanne, can you just guys uh, just share my uh, my forwarded lecture for uh, for this first presentation? Kayo na lang medyo nahihirapan ako. Alam nyo naman pag. Uh, Baby boomer, eh, medyo nahihirapan na. I do not claim um, expertise in these new gadgets. Wala na ako dito. Okay, thank you, Joanne.
Ayan. Okay. Do you, do you guys see my uh, presentation right now? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for this invitation, specifically to Montes. Tess, my idol, oh, my, my friend, malapit ka na maging undersecretary. Anyway, good afternoon again. The title of my presentation is Current Good Manufacturing Processes. Siguro many of you would ask, why did he choose this topic? Why did he choose this? Okay, we will answer that. Uh, in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Okay. As I, uh, as I am now in the academy, we always uh, put our learning outcomes uh, during our lectures, during our presentations, during our seminars. Okay. And at this point, I'd like to give you our learning outcomes. At the end of the module, the participant must be able to, one, understand CGMP and its importance in the manufacturing industry. Why? Blood banks are also considered manufacturing industry because we produce blood components, mainly uh, this is mainly for, uh, just like an example, PBC or American um, Philippine Red Cross that produce blood components. And we are under the guidance of the FDA and we must follow CGMP, Current Good Manufacturing Processes. The next uh, learning outcome is we uh, the participants should identify the five main components of good manufacturing practices. And if we have CGMP violations, we should uh, gain knowledge in this presentation, at least we should know how to handle uh, our violations. And in relation to the good manufacturing processes, I would briefly uh, mention or uh, present to you uh, a brief uh, idea on what is Six Sigma and Kaizen Lean processes. Next slide, please. Okay, good manufacturing processes, they are practices required in order to conform the guidelines recommended by the agencies. Mainly these agencies in my practices is the US FDA because we all know as I mentioned yesterday and I always mention to my students that blood is considered a drug. Since it is a drug, it must be prescribed by a physician, okay? This agency they are the one that controls the authorization and licensing in the manufacture and sale of these five products. Number one, food and beverages. Number two, cosmetics. Number three, pharmaceutical products. This is where our product is, the blood. It falls under the uh, pharmaceutical product, dietary supplements and medical uh, devices we will concentrate on our blood products. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what is CGMP? It refers to the Good Manufacturing Practices uh, Regulation enforced by the FDA. I don't know here in the Philippines, sino nag enforce nito? Uh, if uh, any of you uh, may find work in any cosmetic industry or probably in the manufacturing that's like biscuits, cookies, or other products. Can you go back, please? Okay. Okay. 
adherence to the CGMP assures these five quality assurance practices, okay? Number one, if we produce the product, we want to be sure that it's safe, just like what Dr. Duque had mentioned, safe blood product that is pure, that is, uh, we can guarantee the potency, the potency of it, meaning that if we draw a unit of whole blood, it should be at least 450 uh, uh, plus or minus 10%. If we draw it under draw, and then uh, many times uh, we would say, sayang naman, wag yung itapon. But according to the CGMP regulation, that may not reach its potency. Okay? Just like in a, in a, sa isang gamot, okay? You buy five milligrams of your heart uh, pill. Tapos pala, they produce only, it's only a two milligrams. So it's, it, it's not really uh, reaching its potency. Another one is the identity of the unit. Many times we have problems with the identity of the unit. They are really, uh, binibilisan nyo ko, okay. Uh, and also the total quality of the product, and we call it SPPIQ, safety, purity, potency, identity, and the total quality of the product. Next. Next slide, please. Now we can go. Okay. What is the main purpose of CGMP? It is, uh, its main purpose is to prevent the harm from occurring to the user. Sino ang user natin dito? Yung mga pasyente natin. Yung mga patients, our recipients, okay? We want to be sure when we enforce the CGMP or good manufacturing processes that the end product is free from contamination. Are we sure it's really uh, not contaminated? Many times, I'm sorry to to mention this, uh, I have gone into many, many blood donor drives. I have seen some of our phlebotomies. Hindi na lang ako kumikibo. I just keep my eyes shut. And masama ang loob ko. If I were the one to enforce the policy, if I see that these people are not performing what they're uh, supposed to do during phlebotomy, I will destroy those products. That, that, uh, that it is consistent in the manufacture. What does that mean? When we produce the blood products, uh, just like plasma, cryoprecipitate, platelets, many times these are manually produced. Each of our medical technologies or technicians that produce these products should be very consistent from the beginning to the end product, okay? That the manufacturer has been well documented. It has been well documented. I know that many of you in the audience right now, you are inspector or assessor. As an inspector, me as an inspector for the College of American Pathologists, I always see to it that every product that I follow during the inspection is well documented from the time it was drawn, who drew it, who filtered it, who spun it down, who made the components, who labeled it, who issued it to the, uh, to the hospital, and then in the hospital who cross-matched it, who performed the, uh, the typing, and then who issued it. And then finally, who is the person transfused the, the unit of blood? All right? That the personnel are well trained. In my experience, when, uh, uh, when we have inspection by the FDA, they are very, very strict. All what they do is they come to our facility, they show their badge, they said, there is an inspection. There it goes. I lose already five pounds. 
uh, for the next two to three weeks because they stayed with us for the next two to three weeks. That the product has been checked for the quality that we produce quality products. Uh, one thing I learned from my uh, uh, from my mentor is that just remember when I was uh, an aspiring uh, medical blood banker, medical technologist, he told me, and I would never forget it. And I always tell my, uh, my students, remember the product that you produce, even though you don't know who received it, make sure that put it in your mind that the product that received the 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 component that uh, that you produce is always in your family your father your mother your children your grandchildren okay thank you. next next slide please next slide next slide Okay, quality management system in CGMP. CGMP, CGMP must be in place for component laboratories in order to obtain appropriate quality materials and blood donors. We need to establish robust operating procedures, detect and investigate blood product quality deviations. If there are any deviations in the quality of the product, we must detect it. We must investigate whatever it is, okay? I know that I have received a few, um, few consults from everywhere in the country, uh, all places in the country that uh, in this time and age, it's really very horrifying that some blood products that are positive for any test, just like hepatitis, have been transfused. Okay? Next slide, please. The system of controls. Component laboratories, okay, if you work in a component laboratory, there must be a system of control. It must be in place. And these controls are, must be always in place. And they help prevent instances of contamination. The doctor yesterday before me uh, mentioned all about this, about the contamination, about the safety standards, uh, when drawing blood in the mobile drive, and I learned a lot from it, okay? Instances of mix up, okay? This is when we're labeling and we're, uh, we're beginning to test deviations, any failures and errors. And this assure that drug and the products will meet their quality standards. Next slide, please. CGMP, what's the difference between CGMP and uh, GMP? Yung maliit na C, it means that it's current, okay? It's current. Ito yung pinapatupad ngayon. That's only the, uh, the difference uh, between CGMP and GMP. Next slide, please. Okay, there are five Ps uh, of CGMP, okay? If we maintain and if we follow good manufacturing processes, Okay, and this is how we uh, we maintain it. It it's the people, it's the premises, or it's the facility itself, meaning the laboratory that produces a component. It's the processes. Ano yung process natin? Ano yung pinapalo nating process? And the end one is the products. Okay, the products that we produce, the components that we issue to our uh, facilities and the procedures and after that even though I know most blood banks we are non-profit but we still have what we call the profit or good performance all right 
Next. Next slide, please. All right. It is important to note that CGMP are minimum requirements. I know that many of our facilities, okay, uh, they are very good, okay? They are already uh, following the minimum requirements, okay? And uh, our component laboratories are already implementing this comprehensive uh, modern quality system and the risk management. And sometimes they exceed these minimum standards, just like PBC. I have been at PBC, I know that they produce a lot of uh, good quality uh, component products. Thank you. Next slide, please. The importance of CGMP, okay? Many of our patients, just like me, two years ago, I received two units of pack red sauce during my major surgery, okay? I didn't know. All what, uh, all what I know is that is this safe? I was hoping it is safe, okay? Uh, it says in here in my presentation, a patient receiving the blood cannot detect through touch, smell, or sight that the component that he received is safe or is it going to work, okay? Testing alone is not adequate to ensure quality. Therefore, it is important that blood components are manufactured, I keep mentioning this, under the conditions and practices required by the CGMP regulations to assure that quality is built in the design and manufacturing processes at every step of the way. Just like what I mentioned, it should include the people, the premise, our procedure, our processes and our end products. Next slide, please. Next slide. Example of how CGMP requirements help assure safety and efficacy of blood products. As I mentioned again, our facilities must be in good condition. Are we well equipped in producing these good quality components? We can answer that. I cannot answer that for you. Our equipments or machines that are properly maintained and calibrated. In my next presentation after uh, uh, the presentation of uh, Kenneth, Kenneth, Mr. Kenneth Tunsalan, I'll be presenting quality uh, management, all right? And it's all about the equipment. Okay. Employees that are qualified and fully trained. It's not only important that you train your people. You train them, yes. But did they get the training? Are they fully competent? Do they know what they're doing when they are alone? Okay? As an inspector, that's one of the things that I look. Show me the, 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 the training and the competence, competency training of your uh, employees. The processes that are reliable and reproducible, meaning that ginagawa nyo yan, the process is the same, ang procedure nyo the same. It should be walang deviation, pare-pareho yan. Kung one, step one, two, three, four, five, walang step one, five, six, seven. You, you omit the steps. They should all be the same. All be the same. And every med tech or every technician that produce these products will follow the same procedure over and over again. I know that people are not robots, but unfortunately, that is how we should be doing it in order to produce the reliable and reproducible products through our good processes. Next slide, please. Well, what do we do when there is CGMP violations? If there is fa failure in the CGMP violations, and the product had been distributed, just like many times we, we hear from the news, okay, uh, they, they recall, uh, they recall uh, Tylenol, ayan, uh, iri report yon sa FDA, and then they will, they will, um, they will uh, uh, 
uh, record the product na tatanggalin niyan sa sa um, sa market same way with our blood products with our components if there are any violations if there are any violations that we know of that if we know that if one of our phlebotomists keep doing what they're doing and it was noted that that person had been doing the unsafe drawing of blood products those blood products must be uh, inspected must be quarantined and then if there is still uh, errors and not safe blood products those products must be destroyed and must not be distributed next slide please okay in brief i'd like to mention about six sigma what is six sigma in uh, in relation to cgmp we can employ six sigma six sigma is a discipline statistical based data-driven approach and continuous improvement methodology for eliminating defects in a product process or service so this would be for our product process as a service six sigma can also be taught as a measure of process performance and it is based on the defects per million all right defects per million ilan ang defect per million for, for example you produce million i don't think yet you can produce million uh, blood products i think we can uh, if we draw a lot a lot of them okay next slide please okay there are six uh, sigma principles recognize define measure analyze improve control and standardize we will uh i'm going to mention about the make okay next slide please six sigma tools are problem solving tools used to support six sigma it's called the make d what is d define define meaning that you need to define the problem or you need to see the project also all right in your facility ano ang problem ano naging problema and then number two uh following the six sigma m measure measure the current performance sino man yon ano yung performance non number uh, number three analyze analyze the data if you have okay we say that six sigma are all uh, are data driven data driven so if the same person had been producing all of this and we did not recognize that this person or everybody in the in the facility had been doing the same things that are not up to the six sigma uh, policies we have to analyze them and then after we found out that there is some problem in there we need to improve the process and we need to correct the problem c is after we correct the problem we then control uh, uh, the process in a in a uh, data driven quality strategy to improve the processes for example one of our products that we produce is uh, or several of them are are not uh, are not reaching the the volume yet we still we still issue them for uh, for um uh for uh, transfusion what do we need to do then we know already the problem we already analyzed the problem and we have uh, we have in place the improvement now how do we control we control by again testing and seeing is it uh, people driven is it uh, is it uh, is it the, uh, the 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 equipments is it the process itself all right these are all the six sigma tools next next slide please the six sigma roles uh, these are 
uh, you, anybody who is interested in the Six Sigma, I know here in the Philippines, they offer these courses. I don't know now when we have this lockdown, you know, this quarantine, I, I think uh, that they may uh, provide them uh, long distance, okay? Uh, from the bottom, you can be a white belt. I started as a white belt. You can be a white belter if you get trained with the make. They, they show you what is the make and all that stuff. And within one day, you can be a white belter. And then after that, you can work your way up. And then you, you begin to, uh, to participate in a project, okay? And once you uh, produce a, a project, uh, and successfully presented, you can be a, a yellow belter. And as a green belter, uh, you can assist with data collection and analysis for black belt. Who are the trainer? It's the black belt and master black belt. Okay? Ito yung way up ninyo sa, sa Six Sigma. And uh, uh, the master black belt trains and coaches black belters and the green belt. Just an added information, I'm a green, a green belter before I, I retired. Uh, I was not able to reach a black belt because I was uh, a little bit busy. Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Next slide, please. Kaizen, okay? Uh, Kaizen, what is Kaizen? It's a continuous improvement. It's a strategy where employees at all levels work together. This is group performance in order to achieve regular incremental improvements to the manufacturing processes. I'm going to give you an example later on. Okay, next slide, please. Kaizen is a Japanese term meaning change for the better. Okay, I know I work under a medical director when I was young, uh, aspiring medical technology, uh, black, uh, mm, aspiring a uh, blood banker, I was then in Chicago, he kept asking for what can we do for the better? What can we do? And I will always tell him, we are good, we are, um, uh, there's nothing to change. He said, there is always to change. Look for it, look for it. And at that point, uh, I found out that there is a term called Kaizen, okay? It is a Japanese philosophy regarding processes that continuously improve operations and it involves all employees. Kaizen sees improvement in productivity as a gradual and methodo uh, methodical uh, process. I give you an example in the Kaizen Lean process. We have a laboratory, component laboratory, as the manager and assistant uh, director of the component manufacturing uh, laboratory in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, to, to be a Kaizen Lean process uh, um, uh, um, um, belter, uh, you need to produce some uh, quality improvement. Okay, what did we do? We begin to check the steps, would you believe? We count the steps that every medical technologist, every technician that produce the components. Uh, I wish I could show it to you in person right now. If once you receive a blood component in one area, we count, we count the, the steps, yung step nila, in order to bring it to the centrifuge. Then we count the steps from the centrifuge to the extraction area where they produce the different components. Then we count the steps of every med, um, medical technologies up to the, uh, to the separation area. And then from the separation area to the refrigerator. What do we do? We count all this through the Kaizen Lean process. And then we begin to draw everything and what, what we call spaghetti, okay? How, how did our um, 
um, uh, our project approved when we begin to move everything in order for us not to uh, not to keep uh, crisscrossing each other to save a lot of time. So we move from the time we receive the blood product, we place our centrifuges close to it. From the centrifuge, we make our uh, separation area very close to it. So people will not be walking and not crisscrossing each other. And that is what it meant by Kaizen, okay? To improve the operations. In fact, many of us right now, we have our refrigerators uh, somewhere in the, uh, at the end, and then our platelets at the end, you know, we keep walking and crisscrossing each other. According to Kaizen, lean process, that is a lot of waste of time, okay? Next slide, I think this is the second to the last. Five founding elements of Kaizen, teamwork, personal discipline, improved morale, quality circles, and suggestions for improvement. And I know that there's a lot of uh, managers, uh, probably there are a lot of um, medical directors, pathologists uh, listening right now and that uh, Probably we are thinking about what will be our uh, our improvement that we could do, you know. Eh, pero sabi nga nila eh, kung walang problema, wala kang dapat gawin. Not according to Kaizen. Kung walang problema, tignan mo na how to improve and make it better. Next, next slide. Kaizen and Six Sigma. Kaizen tries to improve the business as a whole by creating a standard way of working, increasing efficiency, and eliminating business waste. Okay, that is Kaizen. Yung waste na sinasabi ko kanina, yung waste of time na you walk crisscrossing from each other, that according to Kaizen, that is a waste. That is a waste. Okay. Six Sigma is more focused on the quality output or the final product. Ano yung pinaka-final product natin? Good quality. Remember, SPPIQ, safety, purity, potency, identity, and the total quality of the product. And Kaizen Lean, meaning that Lean is all about eliminating the waste to increase process speed and quality through the reduction of process waste. I think that's it. I am. I just want to add something na, uh, nice to add that uh, I listen to, uh, I am I am uh, an apolitic uh, person, but I listen to President Duterte's sauna. I heard that one of his lines in there that he wants to eliminate CPD for all the professionals, and I, it makes me very sad. It makes me very, very sad. And now I know that there is, um, there is already a bill that is being put in Congress to eliminate the CBT requirements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sir Ricky, for a very informative lecture on the different strategies to improve our processes in the blood service facilities, namely the CGMP, Six Sigma, and Kaizen Lean process. Now we go to our next topic on review and update on TTI confirmatory protocol to be given by Sir Kenneth Ponzalan. Sir Kenneth, the stage is now yours. Thank you, Dr. Kailin, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon to everyone. As you can see here, 
have the close-up of our coronavirus. It has definitely impacted the way we live, the way we do our daily lives, our routines, most especially how we our program. So it has been exhaustive for the past six months. So moving forward, this is the nationwide case data as of July 28th, we have about 83,673 cases. And this seems to be on the rise in the coming weeks, since we are opening up more and more facilities, more in areas, and we are to expect that definitely our public health will become burdened more and more. So my name is, um, I'll be providing you the updates on the transmission This was supposed to be slated by our laboratory manager, Ms. Rhoda Yu, but unfortunately, due to some unforeseeable circumstances, she won't be able to deliver the lecture for today. So RITM, so we are from the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, and for the last Six months, RITM has been the um, center for the team operations. And as more laboratories are now activated, the UH has begun to shift the role of RITM being the National Reference Laboratory, in which 19 testing will still be done or performed, but uh, this will focus on the validation and quality assurance measures in testing, uh, development of standard laboratory testing centers, the post certification surveillance of test kits and post licensing quality assurance of our testing centers, as well as monitoring the technical performance. So, about us, the Transfusion Transmissible Infection NRL, we're one of the 12 national reference laboratories at our ITM. So, by law, again, we're mandated to do confirmatory testing, provision of an EQA program, training, kit evaluation, and research. But again, uh, since the start of the outbreak of COVID-19, majority of our operations have shifted to COVID-19 testing. And a lot of our staff at the NRL has now shifted to be as augmenters in the COVID-19 laboratory operations at RITM. So moving forward to the lecture proper, nice to history, how our blood program came to be. But how safety and effectiveness are primary concerns of trans medicine and blood collection centers worldwide. So in practice, a blood donor are first screened with a mandatory pre-donation questionnaire. So I'm sharing with you right now this slide. It's called the Project to Evaluate Safety of the Philippine Blood Banking System, which was done in 1994 by Dr. Paraan. Uh, she's also a these are some of the practices that were considered unsafe during that time. So we had blood, we have poor donor screening, we had a blood screening, we had monitoring blood screening, presence of unsupervised freestanding outlets, which are again not subject to any monitoring, lack of blood transfusion committees in hospitals, unsafe waste disposal system, weak quality control. Now, it's been more than 20 years since this was evaluated or since. Do you think a lot has improved? I'd say yes, a lot has improved to the banking system. But some of the practices that were mentioned here are still linked to our blood program. So these are some of the things that we need to address. So basically, the blood samples from our donors as the donor history questionnaire, Tested a list of highly sensitive screening assays. And over the past decade, the advances in these lab testing techniques have allowed earlier detection of certain resulting in a safer blood supply that are available to our patients. However, emerging infectious diseases continue to pose a risk to the blood supply because science that be required to develop, validate, and gain regulatory approval for new to detect these agents. So great efforts 
being made public today are patients from these new and emerging infectious agents for which we do not currently test. So in our the authorities involved in the National Blood Program, the National Council for Blood Services, which is governed by the National Blood Services. So they do provide approval of policies regarding the operation, approval of standards, approval of plans, directional strategic plans for the program, approval of allocation of funds, develop capabilities of the National Blood Services and Blood Services Network, uh, creation of some standing and special committees, and approval of certification of importation privileges. So in addition to the National Council for Blood Services, we also have the HFSR. B, or Facilities Services and Regulatory Bureau. They do, on the other hand, a foundation of health facilities in which they do this for our blood centers or through our blood service network. But something is quite missing in between the authorities involved in the national blood program. So with this, I believe that our direction as a national blood program should be towards good manufacturing practices, as what Surrey mentioned earlier. So GMP, as defined, are a set of regulations established under the authority of the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, used to make sure that proactive steps are taken to ensure that our products are safe, pure, and potent. So GMP is not only up to pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and food products, but it also applies to our blood products. So these are also transfused to our patients. So with GMPs, they have the force of law. So our FD should take this enforcement very seriously. So the standards include mandates that we address issues such as our personnel, our training, our competency, our record keeping, documentation systems, electronic records, facilities, the equipment management, including the validation. So hindi po gamit ng time and gamit. So there are numerous processes that need to be done before we access machines to be used on a routine operation. So the requirements are fairly general, requiring each facility to implement them in a way that makes most sense to them. Okay. So we go now to our blood screening practices. So basically we have the pre-donation questionnaire and we have the post-donation testing of blood products. So these are what we have during our blood screening process. So the the questionnaire assumes that our donors understand the questions asked and that their answers and certain behaviors are truthful. But I guess in our situation, it's not always that case. So most time, most of the times, or oftentimes, we are the ones who are doing these with donors. But the DHQ in itself is pretty self-explanatory. They can answer this on their own. So the DHQ allows the question center to the current general health of our donor, as well as certain behaviors associated with TTI prior to blood collection. So this can be helpful when lab testing is not available or feasible to detect certain insect agents that are identified as TTIs. An example of which could be prior deferrals uh, that exist for donors with recent travel to an area in which malaria is endemic. So, as well as for those who have immigrated from areas in which malaria is So, comparing ourselves to the U.S., we are already available or mandated by law that we test for malaria antigen antibodies. However, in the U.S., there have been proposals to implement testing of donors for plasmodium species, <clears throat> so as not to lose potential non-infected donors during the deferral period. So unfortunately, they do not have a sufficient sensitive malaria screening test for blood products as these have yet to be approved by their FDA. Going to the Philippines setting, our malaria test kits are not evaluated and therefore not regulated by our local FDA. So by design, our DHQ has allowed collection centers to select out donors with low risk of carrying infectious diseases, However, our questionnaire does not capture all infectious donors, and due to the seriousness of diseases caused by RTIs, the testing methods used should be highly sensitive and specific. So as we always say, the DHQ, or the pre-donation questionnaires, will be our first layer of safety. Now, applying this to our current scenario, 
majority of the questions that are arising is, can SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted via blood transfusion? So the risk of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through blood components has not yet been determined. But as any case with any other respiratory viruses like SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, there has never been any report that these are transmitted by blood transfusion. But it would also be good that current donor selection and screening measures should also exclude any individual who is not in good health or with signs and symptoms of any fever or respiratory disease. And although there are uncertainties regarding the presence of viremia in asymptomatic individuals, especially during the incubation period, any potential risk of transmission from blood collected from such individuals is theoretical. Another thing to consider is U equals U. So have you heard of this phrase or of this one? So it means that undetectable viral load means that HIV is untransmittable. So this particularly focuses on HIV. But again, some scientists have mentioned that clearly U does not equal U for blood transfusion. So these, these are high-risk individuals engaging in promiscuous behavior. So definitely, when we do our interview with them, even though that their viral load is not detectable, we still have to defer them from any donation. So there is the potential for confusion for prospective donors in terms of their HIV transmission risk. And although U equals U relates to sexual transmission, headline messaging often simplifies that message committing the sexual transmission aspect which is in the details. So the specific concern for this relates to a known HIV-infected potential donor who thinks they may be able to donate blood because they believe they cannot transmit to others. So it has also been demonstrated that donor's compliance can be seen as secondary to the personal symbolism of donating blood when they are unaware of their risk. So donors tend to frame the donor questioner as asking, is my blood safe? So in the context of heavy and appropriate promotion of U equals U, donors might feel that their blood is safe now and so do not disclose risk factors. So just to summarize, U does not equal U for blood transfusion. So moving forward, we have now our post-donation testing of blood products. So as an additional safeguard beyond the donor questionnaire, Post-donation testing is utilized to detect some PTIs for which our NPDES technical committees have approved, have, have approved some of these tests, or have recommended, rather. So the testing methodologies for screening the products for possible PTIs have vastly improved over the years. So uh, in review, the blood collection centers must use highly sensitive and the NCBS technical committee recommended testing methods to screen for TTIs and donated blood products before making these products, blood products available for transfusion. So the serological methods like antibodies have been the mainstay of TTI screening tests. So in general, if a donated blood product is found to be positive for a TTI, then that product is discarded, specified, and deferred for a specified time period, depending on the TTI identified. And because false positive results can occur with all highly sensitive screening assays, we at the NRL has established our own testing algorithm for confirmatory testing. And it would also be nice to discuss or have a research on the possible re-entry of individuals into the donor pool back again. So one of the things that I would mention earlier is the malaria thing. So the U.S. does not screen for malaria in their products. We in the Philippines uh, do testing using EIA or we use either the blood film. But since we are testing in bulk, we are using our EIA kits to detect either antigen or antibody. So I'd like to share that the current tools for detection in, hoard, in order of sensitivity are as follows. So we have the highly, uh, more, more highly sensitive and specific is our nucleic acid test. But again, if we are to employ that in our routine operation, that would become very tedious to do. 
And after that, we have our blood film examination. The blood film examination will again be dependent on the actual microscopy. And third comes in is at our, our rapid test kits, and the least sensitive is our enzyme immunoassays. So comparing ourselves again with the practice in the US, oftentimes it's like you know, compare natin ang practices natin to other countries. So in the, the absence of a licensed test for donor screening, you measure that they do in the U.S. has been the deferred of donors who hadn't who had, had infection or a possible exposure risk to malaria. So the identification of these donors who potentially could transmit malaria depends on the exposure history obtained during the donor interview. So we need to emphasize the importance again of having this donor interview. So concerning with the gold standard method for malaria diagnosis, and as I mentioned, PCR has shown higher sensitivity and specificity than our conventional microscopic examination of blood smears. And it now seems that this is the best method for malaria. That would always be the utility of gray zone testing. So anything that falls above the cutoff value is considered as reactive, any value that falls below the cutoff value is considered as non-reactive. So we have several blood banks that use the gray zone phenomenon, <clears throat> um, which is also defined as samples within the optical density within 10% below the cutoff in enzyme and assays or chemiluminescent assays to augment our blood safety. But there is plenty of data regarding the usefulness of gray zone samples and its application in TCI screen procedures. So a team of scientists in India looked at their own gray zone sample results and also their confirmatory test results to verify if it adds to blood safety in, our, in their setup. And they performed a prospective analytical study on blood donor samples over the next two years. So what they did was the donor samples were screened for TTI using an luminous assay. So samples with a signal cutoff ratio between 0.9 and 1 were classified as gray zone. So these samples were retested in duplicate and submitted to confirmatory testing. So they have neutralization tests for hepatitis C, immunoblock for hepatitis C, and Western blot for HIV. So from the 50,000 donors that they tested during this period, 1.14 donors were reactive for hepatitis B, C, and HIV, and 0.1% of these were at gray zones, but none of them were confirmed positive. So that is their own data. So the utility of the gray zone testing on their end seems to be limited. However, this may still be continued for the sake of erring on the side of caution. And since, the, since the gray zone only results in a negligible waste that would account to 0.1% of their blood units collected. Again, that is the study they did in India. It would also be preferable or nice if we did our own study here in our country, in our own setting. So the data that you would be producing from this research would be definitely used or would be used as a basis to develop policies, which would be as a guide to our national testing policies. Now, after our serological testing, we have our nucleic acid testing of blood products. So we already have nucleic acid testing available since the early 90s and early 2000s. And while serological screening tests have proved to be useful and cost-effective tools in helping to keep our blood supply safe, but antibody development can take several weeks after pathogen exposure. Resulting in, resulting in a so-called window period between the time of infection and the point at which the infectious donor can first be detected by testing. So much of the residual transfusion-related transmission of HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B is from seronegative donors within this period. So with the addition of SNAP, it can detect our viral DNA or RNA, and this showed promising results. And in comparison to our antibody testing, it reduces the window period for hepatitis C, oh, sorry, hepatitis C by 15 to 60 days, and that's for HIV by 11 to 15 days, depending on which nucleic acid testing platform you are using. 
again, we want to highlight the importance of having nucleic acid testing as an additional layer of safety for our blood screening. So it's about time that we employ this in our national setting. But again, the issue would be the cost effectiveness of our screening or the cost effectiveness of the use of this nucleic acid test. But again, if you would be comparing this to the treatment that the patient will be receiving when they are transfused with tainted blood, then of course, nucleic acid testing would definitely be more cost effective. So here we have the post, uh, this algorithm that we have for our screening tests, which are serological tests. So if these are reactive, we refer to confirmatory testing. But if these are non-reactive, we subject them to NAT. And if they are not detected for their viral RNA or DNA, then they can be released for transfusion. But if it's detected, then you have to refer it again to the National Reference Laboratory for confirmatory testing. So once an individual donor tests positive for either hepatitis B, HIV, or hepatitis C by the nucleic acid test, of course the blood product is excluded from the blood supply, the donor is notified and permanently deferred from donating blood products. So in addition, this is one thing that we are currently still lacking due to numerous issues, especially relating to data privacy. The collection center should always perform a look back to identify any blood donations that, from that donor in the previous 12 months. So we have to remove those products from the blood supply, or if the unit has already been transfused, notifying the recipient of any possible exposure. Now, again, in the US, because uh, such false positive results can occur also in nucleic acid testing, uh, there are specific scenarios in which donors that are positive for hepatitis C or HIV are allowed to re-enter the donor pool after a designated period. So that's around eight weeks for HIV and around six months for HCV. If their repeat testing shows a negative antibody results and not results. So basically we have our serological testing and molecular testing. But a new introduction or it's not really an introduction, but this has also been employed since the past 20 years. So we have our pathogen inactivation. So we also do have improvements in our donor history questionnaire and our testing methodology to screen blood donors, which have been proven to be successful. Unfortunately, our residual transmission of infectious agents still occurs, and our current strategy to not protect the blood supply from new emerging pathogens. So therefore, a great deal of effort has been focused on the developing an effective proactive approach that can be applied to all blood products in the hopes of reducing TTIs while minimizing the technical and financial burdens of screening individual blood donors. So again, uh, one of these methods is called the pathogen inactivation. And these have been used to reduce the transmission of pathogens in manufactured plasma derivatives like albumin and immunoglobulins since the early 80s. So we have now newer pathogen inactivation methods, which include using chemical compounds to copy DNA or RNA, which prevent the replication of infectious agents. So just recently, or maybe six years ago, uh, a Sorolen or UV irradiation-based method was licensed by the US FDA for treatment of plasma and aspirin products intended for transfusion. So in the Philippines, we do have one blood center, that's the Philippine blood center, who is capable of performing the pathogen inactivation method. So it's useful not only for inactivating uh, viral pathogens, but one of the things that are commonly uh, associated with our transfusion are those bacterial contamination, which could lead to sepsis. So pathogen inactivation can definitely be a key to that bacterial contamination. So in summary, uh, we have described the history shortly of our blood supply testing for infectious diseases. We have seen the changes in pre-donation and post-donation testing in that reducing TTIs. And there are uh, still some research and development to improve the identification and removal of infected blood components. Pathogen inactivation has shown a great potential in reducing the of pathogens 
in donated blood components while allowing the potency or effectiveness of the blood products itself when transfused. And it would also allow the effective removal of infectious agents missed by current means of detection, since we only just for the five PTIs, that's HIV, hepatitis B, C, syphilis, and malaria. And this technology, along with research recommendations, would be the guide guidance for the search for superior standards and methods to further reduce our PTIs, and therefore improving the safety of our donated blood components, and in turn, our patient care. So I encourage everyone to get yourselves involved more on research because that's the last thing that we need to do is gather up more on data that would be helpful in establishing policies for our national blood program. So that basically ends my discussion. I just have a few announcements with regards to the operations of the TTIRL. So, as you would all know, uh, we're under the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, and majority of the funds, operations, especially our manpower, has shifted over COVID-19 testing. So all face-to-face -face trainings for this year will be canceled. And however, we would be providing an online refresher course to be scheduled sometime in October. So all you would just have to do is register in our learning and development information system through this link below. And for our EKA test event for this year, it's also canceled. Uh, so what we did was we extended our registration until September 30. And the registration that you submit for this year will be used for the 2021 test event. So no fees will still be charged against all participating laboratories. And specific instructions will be sent by the end of July. So if you do have any questions, you may feel free to contact us through these contact details. And last but not the least, I'd like to say, I'd like to acknowledge my teammates for doing a job well done. in the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. So I haven't seen focus now on COVID-19 testing and uh, the past since um, a lot of us had to undergo quarantine. <clears throat> With that, it's nice to know that we're still as a team together. That's all, thank you. Thank you for reviewing uh, protocols in blood donation in relation to blood screening and updating us on status of equa and referral for confirmatory testing. Uh, we now come to our last topic for today, which is uh, quality management in the clinical laboratory. Again, we would like to call Sir Ricky for the quality management in the clinical laboratory. The stage is yours, sir. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Salim. Ang tagal na tayo hindi nagkikita. Okay. I think we are uh, advanced tayo sa oras, which is good. Okay. I know everybody may be busy even though we are all locked. All right. Uh, my last topic uh, is uh, quality process management in clinical laboratories. I mainly uh, chose uh, this because uh, uh, it's one of my uh, subspecialties that I uh, actually uh, experience out of my 37 years in the US. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, again, our learning outcomes. At the end of the presentation, each participant must be able to understand the process of equipment management, identify critical equipment in the laboratory, develop IQ, OQ, PQ of an equipment in the laboratory, 
understand the process, principle, and purpose, the three P's of calibration. Appreciate the uh, basic elements of quality control in the laboratory. Define validation and the terms used in the validation process. Describe the purpose and principle of equipment maintenance. When uh, I was invited to, to be a speaker here, they asked for three topics from me. And then um, uh, I submitted them immediately. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one, well, one of the requirements is don't be very, very technical. Uh, so uh, after I reviewed the, this uh, ready uh, materials, I found out that some of it may be very technical for some people who may not be working in the clinical laboratory or, uh, but I know that a lot of us are uh, medical technologists uh, that are working in the laboratory so we can uh, follow uh, what is going on in this lecture. Next slide, please. Okay, there are 12 quality system essentials, okay? If I'm, if I'm going to discuss each and every 12 of these, we'll stay here till midnight tonight. But I have chosen only uh, uh, the two that I combined together. It's the equipment. I want to discuss about the equipment and the process management in terms of quality. All right, I'm not going to discuss all the others about personnel and all that stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, equipment management. Equipment management system or EMS involves monitoring, supervising, main, uh, maintaining, uh, or managing, and, excuse me. Yo. Uh, excuse me, uh, Joey, I'm giving a lecture. I'm sorry, nakalimutan kong i-off yung akin eh. Somebody from U.S. called me up na one of our colleagues from PAMET USA, PAMET Texas, uh, died of COVID. That's why they're calling me right now. Okay, equipment management. Uh, it involves monitoring, supervising, managing, and maintenance of equipment uh, in the laboratory. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, what are the uh, lab equipments? Critical equipments in the laboratory, in the component laboratory, not only the equipment, but also the materials are uh, included. The critical ones are the ones that, all, that touches the blood product, okay? Anything that touches the blood product. No, voila. Anything that Anything that touches the blood product or any instrument or any materials is considered critical. And these are the instrument measuring devices, even the computer hardware and software. These equipments must be uniquely identified and operated within the specifications of the facility regarding qualification, Calibration, maintenance, and monitoring. Very, very important. Uh, first, let's go on the unique identification. If you have a big, big facility in the blood bank or in the, your clinical laboratory, you have, for example, five centrifuges, they must be uniquely identified as an inspector I look for the identification. Normally, what we do with this identification right in front of the machine itself, there is an identification. It's not enough to say one uh, centrifuge number one, centrifuge number two, centrifuge number three. That is not enough. 
it must be unique. Like a patient, our patients, they are uniquely identified. They have their medical record and all that stuff, uh, number or their, uh, their ID. Same way with our equipments. They must be uniquely identified. Why? The importance of this is in the future, if there is some disease that may arise, just like right now, you know, we have the COVID that we did not suspect. In the future, many years from now, decades from now, we, uh, there is a new equipment that may, uh, I mean, the new disease. We would be able to trace back uh, all this equipment that touches this blood or blood products. Okay. Next. Okay. We have an equipment. For example, many of us work in government facility. I have seen that uh, uh, in, uh, in many of the provinces, they delivered to you a new refrigerator, a new centrifuge, uh, or any new equipment in there. Okay? And many times, it stays there, it's not, being, uh, it's not being used because it's not being installed, it's not installed. So uh, these is steps that I'm going to mention to you is how you will install and use the, the, the equipment, okay? When you have a new, brand new equipment, just like uh, an example, a refrigerator, okay? Before you can use it, you must have uh, what you call installation procedure, okay? Installation qualification. You must qualify it, all right? Ano itong steps ng installation qualification? You have a refrigerator. Binigay sa inyo, nakakahon yan, okay? Okay. What will you do? The first thing you need to do is, siyempre, you need an electrical outlet, right? you need to qualify first kung saan siya isasaksak. Maka 110 lang yan, sinaksak mo sa 220, putok siya. Wala. Okay? Those are some of the qualifications when you install. And the next one is operational qualification and performance qualification. Before you can use the product, you should, uh, I mean the equipment, you should have to use, uh, have these three. When we inspect, we look for the IQ, we look for the OQ and the PQ. Next slide, please. Okay, what is operational qualification? After you install the equipment, it's now ready for operational qualification. What is the importance of OQ? It is necessary to demonstrate that an instrument will function according to its operational specification, okay? This documentation includes just like a computer system, the data uh, storage data, backup, archiving, functional test. Sino ang pwedeng gumawa ng operational qualification? It could be you as the user, or it could be the vendor. Kung sino yung nagtinda sa inyo, you can uh, ask them to help you perform the OQ, operational qualification. All right. Um, many times that uh, uh, we don't do this, we go ahead and just use the equipment. I know that for a fact. Next. Okay. Okay. After you perform the IQ and OQ, you now have to do the PQ, performance qualification. When do you do this? It's done to demonstrate that an instrument performed according to the specifications defined by the user and is appropriate for intended uh, use. Okay, let's go back again with the refrigerator, all right? This refrigerator, this blood bank refrigerator, it's brand new. According to our um, uh, guidelines, we keep our blood products from two to six degrees, right? And when we buy our equipment or this refrigerator, 
the specifications of the manufacturer must state that that it will maintain a two to six degrees all the time okay and uh, you can use this or uh, in some other testing just like you what can you say about convalescent plasma uh, I will answer that later probably uh, some um, um, okay there's a question in here right now I will answer that later okay and I may need some help when when it comes to all this convalescent plasma all right uh, users should perform minimum of 20 tests for positive and negative tests okay OQ and PQ should be repeated the operational qualification and performance qualification should be repeated when the instrument undergoes major repair relocation and modification your relocation is for example you have it in chemistry laboratory one refrigerator then you move it on the same floor to a blood bank it's still on the same floor you may not need a, uh, a PQ but if you move it from one building to the other that is when you need to perform again the OQ and the PQ okay and when you modify for example may nasira dyan sa isang machine mo okay the speed of your uh, centrifuge it must undergo the same performance qualification over again next slide please calibration okay many times we uh, may, we may be confused uh, between calibration and uh, quality control and validation okay I want to be very technical about this okay what is calibration it's an act of evaluating and adjusting the precision and accuracy of the uh, of the equipment measurement it is comparison between a known measurement yung measurement na yon is the standard alam na natin kung ano yon and the measurement using your uh, instrument now ganun ang gagawin iko compare mo with that standard ito okay and that standard is should be uh, should be the 10 times the accuracy of the device being tested but that is very stiff uh, qualification according to uh, most uh, organizations three to one the standard if you compare it is acceptable all right when you compare your accuracy right now many of us use pipettes or draw pipettes or MLA pipettes okay how do we calibrate them how often do we calibrate them do we even calibrate them do we see that if it delivers uh, 100 ml or 0.10 ml or 0.25 ml that they really deliver that much next slide please the difference between quality control and calibration calibrators give a reference point to the instrument to adjust to all right and controls or quality control make sure the instrument is working properly this okay this is the reason why we have to run control every day all right i know that uh, how often do we need to run control it depends upon your hospital policy or it depends upon your blood bank uh, what are the who who qualifies for the quality control every equipment should be quality controlled all right every blood product that we produce should be quality controlled according to the regulations if we produce pack red salt we have to do quality control at least every month once a month if we produce platelets, if we produce plasma, if we produce 
um, cryoprecipitate, we have to do quality control in them. If the quality control is out of range, we need to use a calibrator to adjust the instrument. So the quality control can, could be brought back, could be brought back within the correct ranges, okay? Next slide, please. Okay. Quality control is one of the most important impacts on laboratory testing, okay? What, uh, what is the purpose of quality control? It is designed to detect, to reduce, and to co uh, correct the deficiency in the laboratory's analytical process. It ensures both precision and accuracy. I know in the academe, uh, uh, we teach this in chemistry about precision and accuracy, right, of the uh, sample result. Next slide, please. Okay, if the quality control is out of range, what do we do? Okay, if the QC is out of range, the lab should perform comprehensive instrument maintenance followed by recalibration, okay? You run the quality control, all right, out of range yeah. Now, you run it again, baka may mali lang, out of range pa rin siya. Now, what do you think uh, you should do next? What's your suggestion? My suggestion is run another control. Probably yung control na yun is, um, is uh, hemolyzed probably or may be contaminated or outdated. Oh, get a new lot number. Run it. If it's still out of range, uh, then you need to investigate and uh, do a root cause analysis. All right. If the, result, if the results are out of control, you may continue to sequester all patient results and undergoes uh, any root cause analysis. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, process management. What is process management? It is a systematic approach in developing new and control the process to policies and procedures, including process validation, test method validation, computer system validation, and equipment validation and quality control. I am just going to uh, um, concentrate on the equipment validation right now. All right? Okay. All right. Uh, babasahin ko na lang yun later, ma'am. Uh, ano? Later. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Maintenance. Why do we have to do maintenance? It's very, very important, okay? It involves the functional check, servicing, repairing, and replacing the necessary device or equipment in the machinery or equipment. It's just like a car. Pag may kochi ka, you have to maintain it para... Okay. All right. I keep uh, getting all these messages and I interrupt ako. Anyway, maintenance. Um... Uh, it's just like a car. You need to service your car in order for it to help you or service you as long as you want to. Same way with our equipments. You have to maintain it. Alagaan mo yan ang uh, equipments mo. Okay? Next. Next slide, please. Okay. We all know this. I know. Uh, uh, we have what we call preventive maintenance. Uh, when you do preventive maintenance, you notice small problems and fix them before the major ones are developed. Parang yung kotse, okay? May bago kang kotse, brand new, all right? Oh, ipa-service mo yan. Tapos, eh, you don't wait till your car, i i ano, i ano ba ito? It will uh, stuck you somewhere in the middle of the night, hindi mo mapaandar. 
because you have not done any preventive maintenance, same way with our equipment in the laboratory. You have to maintain them before huminto na siyang mag-work, okay? Uh, the activities that includes this maintenance or preventive maintenance, uh, uh, so we would know to replace or repair worn parts before they cause the system failure, okay? Ito ang main purpose ng preventive maintenance. Before na malaking sira is makit, uh, uh, magkaroon tayo, i-maintain na natin. Sometimes I can compare this also with our own body, yung katawan natin, okay? Uh, Pagtingin na tayo sa doktor before na magkaroon na tayo ng uh, ano sakit man dyan, na ano, okay? Uh, before na mas malaki pa yung gagastusin, before the entire system will not work, okay? Next slide, please. The objectives of uh, uh, preventive maintenance to enhance capital equipment of productive life, reduce critical equipment breakdown, and minimize production loss due to equipment failure. Same way, okay? Meron akong isang fleet of taxi o kotse. Ganon. Hindi ko minimaintain yung preventive maintenance. Okay? Now, sabay-sabay silang nasira because wala silang maintenance. Okay? I will lose a lot of money because of this equipment failure. Hindi ko sila minimaintain. This is the importance of preventive maintenance. You must have a schedule. Again, as an inspector, one thing I look for is the schedule of preventive maintenance. How uh, I ask uh, uh, mainly the laboratory that we inspect, show me your schedule of preventive maintenance. Show me the history of this machine. If they can show it to me and then it's well documented, then they pass the requirements. Next slide. Predictive maintenance okay i don't know if we uh, we do this i think it uh, predictive maintenance and preventive maintenance is the same okay uh predictive maintenance is estimate when maintenance should be performed okay so kailan uh, if it predict mo kung kailan siya mai uh, uh gagawan ng uh, maintenance uh, the main uh, promise of predictive maintenance is to allow convenient scheduling of corrective maintenance. Now we go into the next slide. What is corrective maintenance? Corrective maintenance is already the most expensive maintenance there is because anong nangyari dito? Ang ating equipment hindi na gumagana. Ngayon pa lang natin siya ipapaservice. Okay? We're trying to save some money by not doing the maintenance. Ngayon, hindi na siya gumana, mas malaking gastos natin because some of the parts nagkahawa-hawa na, hindi na gumagana. Ngayon, it needs a complete overhaul. It needs a complete overhaul. That's why we will not wait for any corrective maintenance. We should be maintaining the preventive maintenance of our equipment. I know most of our facilities, we do preventive maintenance, but it must be well, well, well documented. Next slide, please. Okay, validation. As a process, validation is a process. It involves collecting and analyzing data to assess the accuracy of the equipment, the process, test method, and computer system. Let's just say, uh, again, let's concentrate on the uh, instrument and equipment validation. What does validation involve? Next slide, please. The purpose of uh, the validation is to ensure the product or the service or the system meets the operational needs of the user, all right? It is done to ensure that all processes will produce consistent and repeatable results within the predetermined specification. Example again, I'm going back again. 
in the brand new refrigerator. Brand new refrigerator, you've done already your IQ, PQ, and OQ. Now, can you use it? Not yet. You have to validate it. What does the, uh, uh, what does the um, uh, standards of temperature that we must maintain, two to six degrees, right? If it's low, uh, below two, it's bagsak siya. Pag uh, above six, excess siya. Now, how do we do validation? It is very tedious. Okay, you have a brand new refrigerator. You have done IQ, OQ, and PQ. Now, gumagana na siya. You validate it by putting all the blood products in there. What are these blood products? For example, pack cells. According to the manufacturer instructions or a recommendation, this, for example, this refrigerator can handle 100 blood products, 100 components. Ngayon, saksakan mo siya or you validate this refrigerator by putting 100, 100 uh, blood products. If you don't have, you can simulate it with the same, uh, with the same volume, okay? Now, how will it pass validation? If this reaches the maximum of 100 in capacity, it should maintain between 2 to 6 degrees. If the temperature rises up more than 6 degrees, it fails validation. It fails validation. Kasi ang recommendation niya is 100. O, try mo nalagyan ng 101, for example. Will it reach 100, uh, I mean, uh, 6 degrees or 7 degrees? If it maintains within the 2, two to 6 degrees, then it pass validation. Now, as opposite during the validation, you put only one unit in there or two units. Keep it there for 24 hours, okay? Will they freeze? If they freeze or if the temperature is becoming very cold because solo lang siya doon, masyado malamig, it fail validation. All right? So, there are many ways of validating our equipments. Do them, uh, do the worst scenario, do the uh, minimum uh, scenario, and do the maximum scenario over and over again. Now, how often, uh, uh, how, uh, how much do you do for your validation? It's up to your medical director. Uh, to say, or even the company would uh, would recommend this is how much you would do for the validation. I cannot dictate that uh, to you. Next slide, please. There are four main types of validation. Prospective, concurrent, retrospective, and revalidation. All right, next. Validation in the uh, clinical laboratories uh, uh, of the clinical laboratory instrument. The ultimate goal is to provide objective evidence. Objective evidence meaning itong evidence na to it's written. Okay, lahat yan naka uh, all the data that you get. They are all, and these are the things that you have to show to your um, regulating agencies. Pakita mo nga sa akin yung validation mo. Bakit ito? Brand new ba ito? Kailan nyo ginamit ito? Okay? That the method or the equipment will show acceptable reproducibility and accuracy to be clinically uh, applicable. Okay. Hello. I'll give, uh, I will deviate from the equipment right now. Many of us are supervisors or managers in the clinical laboratories. I know that. We have about 318 participants right now. Many of you write procedure, SOPs, okay? Now, very, uh, very practical ito. I write an SOP. For example, in blood bank, I write a new SOP on um, 
blood typing using the gel technique. Okay. Now I wrote it. I gave it to my medical director. The medical director says, okay, it looks good. Okay. My question is, now it looks good. Can you use it right away, right now, with that new procedure that you wrote? I don't think so. No, you cannot, according to uh, the standards. Okay? It must be validated, that procedure. Okay? Yung procedure na sinulat nyo, it must be validated. Sino magbabalidate nito? Yung mga tao nyo. You have to validate it. Is it working? Can they follow it as easy as possible? For example, number one, you have to prepare your equipment. All what you need to do is watch uh, all your medical technologies perform the new procedure according to how it's written and signed by the medical director. If they can follow it easily, but uh, um, then uh, and all your med techs that did this procedure that you asked them to, they said yeah, it is, and you documented it, then that, that SOP pass validation. But if they keep making mistakes in the procedure, they keep missing it because it, uh, that, that step in that, in that uh, SOP seems to be not important. They keep missing that, uh, that step then you have to rewrite the SOP and you have to validate it once again. Okay, that is what I say. It should be uh, accurate and it should be reproducible or repeatable. Next slide, please. Method validation. Uh, is the process to confirm that the analytical procedure employed for a specific test is suitable for its intended use, okay? Sometimes we have some process na hindi naman pala pwede ito, okay? One of the things I will share with you, okay? In the company, my last company, Las Vegas, when I work, we begin to produce uh, jumbo plasma, triple platelets. Then the company said, all right, we now have to produce jumbo cryoprecipitate. Jumbo cryoprecipitate. So what we did is we keep producing the cryo. And then when we validate it, we failed miserably. We failed miserably. We're not reaching the, the, the fibrinogen level that we wanted to. And then we found out that there are several facilities doing the same validation as we do, that they also are uh, failing miserably. So what happened? They said this project is canceled. We just, we just deal with our single cryo precipitate in our single bags. Okay, next slide, please. Instrument validation. Okay, I mentioned this already. It is a, a series of process through which your test system to verify the performance specification by the manufacturer of the instrument is followed. Okay, ano ibig sabihin to? We validate it. For example, we have a pipette. Sabi niya, okay, it should deliver 25 microliter. Okay, it should consistently delivering 25 microliter over and over and over and over again, all the time, all right? Next slide, please. Prospective validation is before, okay? Before we use the equipment, before we distribute, uh, distribute another, uh, a new product, just like what I said, you know? We have a new product. We want to distribute a jumbo cryoprecipitate in one bag. Okay, we need to validate it. Okay, and then we uh, produce a new process by uh, producing that new cryo. All right, and uh, there is also another validation of our computer. If you upgrade your computer, of course you change it because we use electronic cross match. And 
If you revise your validation plan, your existing validation plan, you need to do a prospective validation. Next slide, please. Retrospective. Retrospective meaning nakaraan na, okay? Meron ka na, pero hindi pa na-validate. Hindi siya na-validate, but you have already the product, okay? You need to do a retrospective validation. It should be controlled and it should be documented. Ito document nyo, this is a retrospective validation. At least it is documented, you know that you perform the validation. Next slide, please. Revalidation. Okay, kailan pa dapat mag-revalidate? When there is a change in the actual process that may affect the quality of the end result. Okay? Nag-iba yung, uh, yung process nyo. Like for example, okay? Ngayon, uh, you are doing a manual process. Now you change into an automated process. Okay? Ngayon, iba yung uh, 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 nag-iba yung process nyo. You need to do a revalidation on all that and begin to compare itong result mo sa manual and also your uh, automated procedure. Are they the same? Are they coming out the same with your result? Okay? If there is a negative trend in the quality indicators, you need to do a revalidation. Okay, again, if there is a change of product design, now the product design, just like what I mentioned, you know, jumbo plasma, okay, we normally have one single plasma before. Now we can use jumbo plasma, big bags, okay, and uh, you change the design, you change the bag, you change the, okay, uh, uh, you change the design of it, you need to do a revalidation. And as I've said, if the equipment is moved from one place to the other, for example, from one building, okay, our facility consists of several buildings. You move your uh, centrifuge from one building to the other, it must be revalidated. Next slide, please. Accuracy and precision. In chemistry, we know what is accuracy and precision. Many of my students are in the audience right now, okay? I give this all uh, to them. Accuracy is how close a measured value to the actual value. And precision is how close the measured value to each other. The more measurements you make, the better the precision and the smaller the error will be, all right? And I'll show you an example of accuracy and precision now. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. In the first one, in the first one, you see a high accuracy and high precision within the target. Okay? Within the target. Magkakatabi sila. And then low accuracy but high precision. Okay? It did not, itong nasa right hand side mo at the top, it did not meet the uh, the accuracy, hindi niya na-target yung gitna mismo, yung target, okay? Pero, it's very high in precision kasi ang target niya is all magkakatabi lahat sila, okay? And in the other one, it's high accuracy but low precision, okay? Meron siyang uh, accuracy, it's very accurate, it's accurate because it reaches the target but they're not close to each other. And the other one is low accuracy and low precision. Yung, yung arrow is all over the place. All right? It's all over the place. It did not reach the target. It's, uh, they're not uh, consistent. They are not close to each other. That's why it's low accuracy and low precision. Next slide. I think that's it. Next slide. Meron pa ba? Next slide. Next slide. Okay, bias. Ah, okay. I just want to mention bias. Uh, can we go back again into the last slide, please? Anyway, we're still early. Bias. Ano yung bias? It's a built-in error with, uh, which make all measurements wrong by a certain amount. Okay? 
kung minsan hindi natin maiwasan ito, o kung minsan we, we take for granted about bias, I give you a very good example in here. Okay? Okay. Mag, uh, titimbang ka, pero hindi mo ziniro yung scale. Uh, actually, meron na siyang 1 kilogram doon or 1 pound already. Okay? That is a bias. Okay? Sometimes, uh, you're going to... Uh, to the to the doctor to the clinic. Oh, titimbangin ka, kukuhanin yung height mo. Pero nakasuot yung sapatos mo. So, that is a bias already because that is not really uh, that is not really the exact. It may mean a few uh, uh, few of measurement. Okay, a stopwatch that takes half a second to stop when click. When you click it, it takes a about half a second. This matter a lot during the Olympics. All right? That is the bias. In each case, all measurements are wrong by the same amount. And that is what we call bias. And I think this is all for me. Thank you for having me uh, uh, yesterday and today. And uh, I think there will be some announcement. And any questions, I will be very glad to answer. Please, uh, I am not expert right now with regards to the COVID. You know, I know that somebody asked me about the COVID. Uh, and the only thing I could say, it, it looks uh, very promising right now about the convalescent plasma. I hope it will work. And uh, since uh, this COVID is uh, very, very new, uh, I have not been going out because I am double jeopardy. Uh, uh, I I am not much. Uh, thank you, Sir Ricky. Okay. Um, uh, I have not gone out uh, many times. Uh, the only communication I have uh, much is uh, through webinar and also through the uh, through the news that I I see. But if you ask me about the, okay. You have to discuss about the, ay, sandali ha, babasahin ko itong mga questions. We have enough time anyway. May I ask what are the reference ranges for hematocrit plus, may hemoglobin, potassium, pH, in the quality control, blood units, and components? I think uh, uh, the best people that can answer this right now are the people working at uh, PBC right now because they are the most current people that produce the blood products or uh, people working in, uh, in uh, Red Cross that produce uh, the blood products. All right. So I know that uh, blood, um, according to AABB, quality control for blood products, you need to do four, four products every month, four plasma, four uh, RBC, four platelets, and four cryoprecipitate if you produce them. If you use granulocyte, since you don't produce as many granulocyte, uh, the white cells for neutropenic patients, you can do it at the same time when you do it, uh, when you draw a granulocyte product. But all the others, hematocrit and all that stuff, it may have changed right now. Uh, I need some uh, assistance from uh, people working in PBC or Red Cross that are in the audience probably. Uh, they can answer this uh, right now. Uh, yeah, with regards to the requirements, with regards to the potassium level, uh, I don't think we 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 uh, uh, we measure potassium levels. The only time that uh, the potassium levels is uh, is avoided is when we give blood products to our uh, neonates or babies. But since uh, we do not measure potassium levels on our on our blood products. Uh, uh, especially the red cells, I'm not going to talk about whole blood because um, we do not have whole blood, is uh, uh, we, we use fresh unit of blood to be transfused to neonates and to babies, especially for our babies uh, needing 
uh, exchange transfusion. So we choose less than seven day old uh, blood products to avoid the high potassium level. Basahin ko pa yung ibang question. Huh? The pH, oh, actually, uh, the platelet, uh, we uh, we check the pH in there. It should be uh, uh, higher than 6.2, uh, 6.2. Oh, okay. Same, same question. Oh, uh, will be emailed to you after three day webinar. Okay. Uh, ano itong, it will be emailed to you. Ah, uh, anybody that needs the PowerPoint presentation from this webinar will be uploaded on our MBBSP website. Will be emailed to you after three day webinar. Ma'am Joanne. Ma'am Joanne, are you there? Ma'am Joanne. Ma'am Joanne. Ipamimigay ko yung aking PowerPoint. Sabi ko, papayag ako yung pamimigay mo as long nakakanta ka muna. Okay. All certificates will be sent after the three-day webinar through registered email. Submitted. Okay, certificates will be emailed to participants who answer the evaluation form. Okay, good day to all. Please answer. It. Can you say about the convalescent plasma patient? Positive. Okay, tayo na po ulit. Okay, thank you. Okay, wala na. Any other questions, please? Thank you for having me. I know I have uh, online. One of my favorite friends, my uh, Dean, uh, Dean Senaida Kahokom from Onciano University. I am honored to have you there, ma'am. One expert in blood bank. Anjan siya, hindi siya kumikibo. She is there. Ma'am, I miss you po, ma'am. That's it for me po, kung wala na kayong question. Uh, thank you, Sir Ricky, for sharing to us the validation and verification methodologies and instruments, including CAPA, no? Corrective Action and Preventive Action. It was a very technical lecture, but at least those who are non medtechs will be familiar on these processes in the laboratory. Now, uh, may we call uh, uh, Sir Ricky for uh, some uh, question and answers from others. Uh, we will check the uh, Q&A chat box if there are questions. Okay, so if there's none, uh, we, we have some uh, questions here, no? For Sir Ricky, no? Yes. Uh, our hospital is uh, ISO 9001 certified in quality management system. Wow, I think... Okay. So does it mean that uh, we also comply to uh, a current uh, GMP or uh, yes. does this GMP differ from any quality management system? Yes, doctor. Uh, many of this, uh, you know, kasi nag-iiba, nag-evolve lang itong mga, mga quality systems na to eh. No? From uh, ISO whatever number before, now, you know, CGMP. Most of this, uh, if you review uh, their, uh, their uh, requirements, almost pare-pareho yan. If you are ISO, okay, you have a gold standard, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kalim. So it means that you are performing what needs to be done. And I salute you for that. Very good. Thank you, sir. So for, for Sir Kenneth naman po, no? Uh, we get lots of uh, reactive uh, HBSAG uh, blood units, no? With uh, COV falling within the gray zone, wherein these uh, blood units are thrown away. 
And when the confirmatory results from RITM comes in after several months, it comes out to be negative. Uh, uh, only around 10 to 20 percent of our referred samples are confirmed positive. So if we compute based on our blood collection, we should not have been uh, throwing at least uh, 3,000 to 4,000 blood units no, because of this gray zone. So what is the recommendation of uh, TTI, NRL in reducing blood wastage due to these false reactive results? Sir Kenneth, yes, you may answer. Yes, no, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, in that case, well, uh, there are numerous factors if it leading to uh, having those type of gray zone results. Eh? You know, how frequent you do your uh, preventive maintenance, your daily maintenance, eh? and your sample collection as well, and how often you do your calibration, actually calibration. So, if ganun kataas siya, we need an investigation in particular dun sa manner of testing in that laboratory to see how they are uh, actually doing routinely. Uh, in a way, hindi kasi natin sa ma-assess when we do our EQA program kasi um, what happens is, you know, oftentimes it's special treat na ginagawa sa kanya. So, I think we need to study carefully the data and also the practices of that laboratory before they could come up with a recommendation on how to deal with these type of uh, increase in green zones that are resulting to not non-reactive after confirmatory testing. It could also be na the um, issue po natin is uh, talaga highly sensitive equipment natin. But again, uh, we have to first study yung data po natin before we could come up with the final recommendation. Okay, so is there any more question from the participants of this webinar? So if there's none, we are actually uh, still early for the scheduled uh, webinar, no? So if there's no more question, uh, we would like to invite uh, Sir Ricky Martinez and uh, Kenneth Punzalan for the uh, awarding of the Certificate of Appreciation. No? So yeah, if I flash po ng ating NBB staff yung ating certificate, so the certificate reads, the National Voluntary Blood Services Program awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Felicissimo D. Martinez Jr. and Kenneth uh, Aristotle Ponzalan in grateful appreciation of their invaluable dedication and commitment for sharing their expertise as speakers of this webinar of the National Blood Donors Month 2020, Dugoyanihan, Isang Pamilya, Isang Lahi, Isang Bansa on 29 July 2020, facilitated by the National Voluntary Blood Services Program of the DOH in celebration of the National Blood Donors Month from 28 to 30 July 2020. Issued this July 29, 2020 in Quezon City, signed Nestor F. Santiago Jr., MD, MPHC, MHSA, CESO 2, Assistant Secretary of Health, Public Health Services Team. So congratulations, Sir Ricky and uh, Sir Kenneth. Maraming maraming salamat po for uh, giving time to this uh, webinar. Okay, so we would like to also invite uh, the participants for our day three tomorrow. No, So we hope that uh, you also uh, uh, fill up our uh, uh, evaluation form so that you can get your certificates also. So maraming salamat po and hope to see you uh, tomorrow at 1.30. So, and also reserve your questions for the convalescent plasma for tomorrow's webinar no, with Dr. Pedrito uh, Tagayuna. So maraming salamat and magandang hapon po. God bless po sa ating lahat.